Welcome to the Stefan Levera Podcast. Hey guys, welcome to the show. This is Stefan Levera Podcast 19 and my guest today is Vortex. Welcome Vortex. Hey, how you doing Stefan? It's great to be here. Great to have you on. Uh, and uh, I guess I'll just introduce you by your real name, Jeffrey. Um, so Jeffrey is a very well-known Bitcoin YouTuber and podcaster within Bitcoin. And he's previously worked and interviewed many, many people in Bitcoin. He's run a lot of different um, you know, stream and news shows. And just now he's actually starting up his own new network called the CryptoCast Network. And he's also doing a Bitcoin programming education course, making use of N Bitcoin and C Sharp. So if you didn't understand any of those things, we're going to try and we're going to go into that and explain a little bit further. Um, so Jeffrey, maybe you want to tell us a little bit about what you're doing with the CryptoCast network. Sure. So, uh, well, thanks for, again for having me. I really appreciate it. Uh, you've, you've, I think you've interviewed more people than me but, uh, at this point, Stefan. You just keep on putting <laughs> more content than I think the rest of us can keep up with. We, we try, but it's, it's it's actually getting pretty difficult. I think somebody mentioned we're, we're kind of in a golden age, right, for podcasting. Uh, there's a lot of great people out there. So, yeah, uh, with the CryptoCast Network, uh, this is a new network that I've just started. I've actually been on the, the World Crypto Network uh, YouTube channel there for a couple of years, and I wanted to start out my own uh, YouTube YouTube channel just of recently uh, to focus more on tech related content, uh, more tech related shows focused on more people uh, interviewing more people in the space, much like you do, uh, Stefan. I've, I've I've heard a lot of uh, your great interviews already as well, and we interview a lot of the same people, you know, because really the space it's it's not so big yet. It's a, it's still kind of small, uh, you know, the Bitcoin space, and so a lot of people uh, we, we meet at a, uh, we meet at different conferences and things like that. But um, with the CryptoCast Network, it's it's basically a a, a podcast YouTube you know a podcast uh, network work with a, a YouTube channel that is focused on uh, speaking about uh, speaking with people in the crypto and Bitcoin space. And so we've been having a lot of fun interviewing a lot of people. There, we have a lot of different shows on there. We just recently uh, launched a show on there with Beauty on uh, called Bitcoin Matters. And then we uh, we just launched a Q&A show uh, with the host Heidi there uh, of um, Crypto Tips. Uh, she has a, crypt, a YouTube channel called Crypto Tips. And so, yeah, we're just trying to uh, push out a bunch of content and hope that, uh, you know, the, the people uh, enjoy it because that's really what it's about for us is getting information out in the space because there's so, just so much noise, you know, and uh, we really try to provide the signal uh, that we think that the community deserves. Yeah, that's right. And I think one thing that we're seeing now is a lot of just chatter and talk about random ICOs and random other blockchains. And I think one thing that's needed is to really focus it back on what is really important. So do you want to talk a little bit about why Bitcoin and not, you know, some of the other overhyped blockchain technology? Well, it's interesting. You know, I think that the whole uh, Bitcoin not blockchain thing is starting to come make a big comeback. You know, you know, we're in this bear market. We've been in this bear market now for about, you know, eight or nine months. And so there's been a, a little bit of downplay on the whole, you know, market in general. But really uh, what we've seen is that people, you know, move away from these alts, from these ICOs. We've seen the, the, uh, the Bitcoin dominance now rise of over 45%. And, you know, it's it, it's getting higher and higher every day. I think it's over 50% now. And uh, I think I was, I was thinking of the SegWit <laughs> uh, uh, transactions there. I think they're over 45% now. But yeah, uh, you know, more, uh, more and more people are kind of, I think, understanding here that uh, the internet of money lies within Bitcoin. This is where the innovation is because this is where the term blockchain comes from. This is where, uh, you know, all of the focus on sound money is. And and it's really, it's, under, it's, it's sort of painful for people, you know, to listen to these people who try to say that, you know, MySpace, you know, they came first, so then came Facebook, and then there's going to be something else. There's always going to be something else. And of course, there's always going to be something else. However, you know, we have only one TCP IP, right? We have only one internet. There was a focus there, a very, very, very fine focus on bringing communication to the world, right? This was a really, really big uh, focus uh, to be able to have a decentralized network, something that can't go down with, with any central point of failure, right? So, this is what, what what the focus is for Bitcoin to have this sound money. There's a very very fine focus. You know, people sometimes call us Bitcoin maximalists, but really that's you know it, that was a term invented by Vitalik just to kind of sort of um, you know um, the, the fame and and sort of sort of make light of the fact of the single minded focus of creating sound money. This is really really important. You know, there's all sorts of innovation going on, various technologies, various other blockchains. It's there's 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 things happening, but it, it's it's really not super important because most of it is actually uh, 
just a, just just a database. You know, it can be redistributed with just a database. It's it's not uh, it's not really as Jimmy at the song you know pointed out in many uh, of these conferences. It's it's mo- blockchain at this time at this point in time is really just a buzzword. It means nothing anymore, and it's unfortunate because you know we uh, the Bitcoin people still understand that Bitcoin's blockchain is here for a very, very important reason. It is uh, really the only uh, blockchain because it really is, in my opinion, the only decentralized blockchain at scale. This is uh, the, the dream of cypherpunks that has been you know, on their minds for decades. You know, uh, Satoshi was simply standing on the shoulders of giants like many before him. And uh, with this single-minded focus of creating a digital money, right, a, a monetary system outside of the state, something that a, no central party can can control. And so this is, um, you know, this is what I believe is important because, uh, you know, as, if you read the book, the, the Safetyans book, uh, Bitcoin Standard, you'll, you'll sort of get an idea about how sound money, it, when we have sound money, we can have a golden age. And so w- I think that that's where the focus should be. I think that that's where many of the smartest people on the planet are working on because they see that importance. And, you know, it's just unfortunate to see a lot of this uh a lot of this other um focus on blockchain stuff and some of these projects that really aren't that important to humanity but uh really do uh make a lot of money with vcs and uh, raise a lot of capital and uh do a lot of advertising and you know uh and have a lot have a large quote-unquote market cap which of course has zero market depth at all but it it, it's um we i think that again uh, this is turning around now with the bitcoin dominance i think we're now getting more to the bitcoin not blockchain and it's going to take the market time it will take the market time uh, and eventually it will figure out what's going on as you know it continues to price bitcoin above anything else and so I think that uh, we will uh, really understand this. And, and again, with with the maturity of Lightning coming uh, over the next year or two, uh, people are going to really start to to wake up to what Bitcoin can do. Yeah, great point, great comments. I think the I like the point you made around how Bitcoin is the really the only decentralized blockchain at scale currently. And I think the other thing that you were commenting on that would be great if you could expand on for the listeners is. I think you've commented there about how many of the altcoins and ICOs, they have an established corporation and marketing budgets and so on. Whereas the way I perceive Bitcoin, it's really more of a community feel and it's really more of an organic growth. There is no Bitcoin marketing team. And so as such, individuals just kind of take it on themselves to do that. And to some extent, that's where some of these you know networks and podcasts uh, playing that role. So did you want to comment on your thoughts on the marketing budget vision of crypto cryptocurrency versus the community or organic based uh, feel? Yeah, it's interesting because, you know, a lot of people, there's, there is some people in the space that are like, look, we, you know, we need, we need some kind of centralized organization. We need to mirror what we've understood before, right? We, we, we don't understand uh, free open source software development. And so we're like, we, we need to create a foundation. We need to, you know, we need to create a a leader. You know, there's some people in the space that just, just aren't familiar with, with this type of, uh, this, this, this type of software development excuse me, this type of software development, because at the end of the day, this is what Bitcoin is. It's software. It's created by developers. And of course, it lives in the meat space as well as, as, as everything does, because this is how it is built by humans. But this is software. This is the digital realm. And this is, uh, you know, this is important. And so I think what people need to understand is is that uh, Bitcoin is decentralized. This you know this word is even me- becoming meaningless these days, I guess. But what this means is that this is there is no central point of failure. There is no leader. This is a grassroots organization, as as you may have said. This this is what um, this is what decentralization actually looks like. Because until your network has been attacked by you know billion dollar bi- billions and billions of dollars of corporations. 90% of the miners, right, until you have have had a social attack, until you've had all of this stuff coming down and still survive that, your chain is not simply not decentralized, right? It's never been fully tested. That's why we say Bitcoin is the only uh, decentralized blockchain at scale because it's been through these types of um, these types of challenges and it has ha- has uh, the security has hardened uh, to represent that you know we have this this nakamoto consensus with these full nodes this is what drives the rules and so if you don't like those rules well then what ends up happening is you you fork off and some people have this problem of this leaderless structure you know pierre richard has a great great content on this i highly recommend your viewers uh, follow pierre richard he's done uh, he's done video He's done papers. He's done uh, slides. All of this stuff, presentations, and and all of this uh, podcasts. He also has uh, the noted podcast, but he talks about this at length about 
how Bitcoin's governance structure works. And it really is decentralized. You have to put in a proposal. You have to be able to get people behind you. You have to be able to get consensus. You have to be able to build a community support around it. You can't just get your stuff, you know, you can't just get your stuff merged in. Uh, this is what makes Bitcoin decentralized. You know, a lot of people think that uh, the Bitcoin core uh, team is in complete control. But, you know, as Eric Lombroso has just been tweeting out just recently, he, he you simply can't just merge things in. If you merge things in, let's say Eric Lombroso wanted to be the king of Bitcoin, he merged something into Bitcoin. Well, the rest of the, the nodes aren't, are, are going to immediately, you know, immediately invalidate that and he'll be forked off to his own chain. You simply can't mm. change Bitcoin without consensus. And that is what, yep. you know, that's the difference. That's the big difference. And so I think that's the important difference between uh, this and Silicon Valley, right? This free open source development versus Silicon Valley, the centralized sort of, uh, you know, um, top down approach where people want to have some idea, uh, you know, get a little bit of a uh, get a little bit of uh, marketing money, get uh, get their product out there. And then that's that. And that's fine. But, you know, we're not building products here. We are building protocols. And that's what's important about Bitcoin. It is a protocol where the rest of these things, like you say, uh, you know, Stefan, they're just companies. They're just centralized organizations. And some of these centralized organizations like Ripple, right? They're even saying that, hey, guess what, guys? We are going to be more decentralized. We promise we'll be more decentralized. <laughs> this has been, but, but this, this comes from their lead marketing director, right? And so it just, it starts to break down really fast for anybody who's paying attention. And and I, that's, I think what I, your viewers really need to understand is the difference there is that Bitcoin is decentralized. It is free open source software development and it has no leader. And this is the way that we prefer it. Yeah, great points about, you know, all of those comments. And I think it would be great um, if you could maybe outline and explain just for the listeners, what does it mean to merge in code and run a node? Like if we could just outline a little bit about, you know, that distinction. Sure. So, you know, as I say, you know, Bitcoin is free open source software development. So it has, it lives on GitHub. You can actually go to github.com slash Bitcoin slash Bitcoin and see the source code. And so uh, there are people that are developers out there. And then there's people that review the source code. And uh, at the end of the day, there's people that merge in new code into Bitcoin. And then the nodes, of course, can choose to run this or not. See, what happens is, is uh, they there's an upgrade to Bitcoin. And then there's hundreds of thousands of nodes around the world that will either upgrade or not. If they choose to upgrade, that means that, that they approve of the software, right? That means everything's good. They'll, they'll, they'll approve, get new features, and everything's great. Now, if say somebody like like a, like my example, right, wanted to be king of Bitcoin and merge something in, and the rest of the nodes mm. didn't agree with this, right? If they merge, the, if they uh, import code in there, and the rest of the nodes, the rest of the network doesn't agree with this, that means that uh, that is not Bitcoin, and they will get immediately forked off. So no, when I say nodes, I mean these these full validating nodes that are some choose to event, identify themselves, you know, on the network, and so we can see like around a couple hundred thousand or so. But there's many, many more than that. Many, many, many more than that that choose to not to identify themselves. And that is what is consensus. That is what we call network governance. That's what Pierre Richard likes to say is this is the network governance of full nodes validating rules. And these rules can be changed, but it's quite difficult. Like I say, you have to get consensus across the whole network. And so, the, again, this is what makes uh, you know Bitcoin uh, decentralized. Yeah, great points around the running of a node. And that's what when people participate in the Bitcoin network, they can choose to run their own node. And in that way, they are validating the rule set of what transactions they will accept or reject on the basis of what software they are running. And so it's an interesting point you mentioned around the you know free open source software process where just because the guys who are developing in Bitcoin Core, which is one of the implementations of Bitcoin, just because they release a new version doesn't mean everyone will like it and that they will run that code on their machine. And so in a sense, Bitcoin Core, when they release a new version, they are in a sense, they're competing with the prior versions of their own software. Do you want to comment on that? Absolutely. No, no, you said it pretty well there, Stefan. That's exactly uh, how it works. You really do have to gain a community consensus. You have to gain a community following. You have to convince people 
that your change is valid, that your change is important, that we should all upgrade to your change. And this is how it should be, right? In uh, in a sort of a merit- meritocracy type of network where everybody, you know, is is uh, thinking adversarially, maybe that update has a problem, right? Maybe it hasn't been fully peer reviewed yet. We have to make sure that that update is good. It's peer reviewed. It, you know, it's signed by the the actual GitHub itself, the, the uh, sorry, the repo itself, the Bitcoin repo itself. We have to make sure where the code is coming from, where the binaries are coming from, if they're signed or not. You know, this is how we, uh, this is the mantra of Bitcoin is to, you know, th- this, this is how we, we try to tell the world that we have to uh, don't trust, verify. This is this is the very heart of Bitcoin and its adversarial thinking and its game theory. This is what drives, uh, this is what makes sure that everybody's sort of almost got a, a gun to everybody else's shoulder, right? This is what Nakamoto, Consenso, uh, Nakamoto consensus is. And uh, this is how Bitcoin uh, works and functions. And it's been working great, you know, uh, for the last 10 years. Mm, yeah, great points around meritocracy. I think that's another point that might be good for you to expand on, Jeffrey, is just because, you know, there are, say, a few people who have, who are maintainers of the Bitcoin core code base, and they are able to merge a change into that code base. Uh, but could you just uh, outline that they are not necessarily the king of the repo, so to speak, or that, they, they, you know, other um, you know, that change still has to get reviewed, right? Absolutely. So it still has to get peer reviewed. You know, if, for example, if somebody merged a change that was uh, that, that was just not peer reviewed at all, you can bet that the somebody is going to probably remove the access to that person, that person's ability to merge changes. Uh, these people do not, you know, take this very lightly. Again, there are hundreds, hundreds of contributors to the Bitcoin Core repo from across the world that do all sorts of peer review code. You know, even just take care, uh, you know, even contribute to the Bitcoin.org website and and make sure that you know the the people are up they did with the latest version to make sure that that's actually uh, signed from the correct binaries to make sure that uh, the latest information is up to date so that people understand what's going on. So, you know, there's a whole lot of contribution and it's all voluntary. You know, a lot of it's voluntary. Now, of course, there are a couple of companies like Chain Code Labs, right, and and uh, Block, uh, Blockstream that employ a couple of these core developers. But again, you know, it's this is a, a group process. There are mailing lists, there are IRC chats, there are discussions that happen that has to happen first, and everybody has to agree. Uh, a lot of these changes, Stefan, take years. You know, to actually go through the the whole process of creating a proposal, uh, uh, getting community support around that proposal, implementing code, and then getting that code peer reviewed, and then uh, you know checking that on testnet, getting that on testnet for a while, then making sure that is peer reviewed, right? And then finally, yeah. you know, finally getting it merged in, and then again, that's the last part. Then you still have to, con- you know, then the rest of the nodes still have to update to that change. And that's what really, you know, that's what really is great about Bitcoin is that not, we can get, we can be guaranteed that not just anything can be merged in there and not just any single person can take over the repo. Because again, there's lots of different parts to the process. And if there's any hink and, you know, if there's any kinks in the process, they'll be, they'll be changed, right? So Gavin, right? We had Gavin, uh, we had Gavin's access removed. And that was in my, I'd like to argue that that was a good thing. He hasn't really contributed a whole lot you know, uh, lately as of late before he got his keys removed, but then he got his keys removed, right? The, the, the network acted. And so if there was people that the, that the network believes to be bad actors, you know, they're, they will be removed in some way, somehow the will, they will be excluded. And I think that, uh, this is really important for the network to do in order to stay stable. Yeah. Yeah. And I think another point that would be great for you to touch on is just the, adversarial thinking so i'll just outline a little bit of context a lot of other cryptocurrencies have smaller network effects around them they have decreased security and as such they have not faced the same level of threat that bitcoin has so can you comment a little bit about how you know the importance of adversarial thinking within bitcoin and bitcoin development Yeah, so it's really interesting because, again, you know, no single actor controls all of the Bitcoin network. So it is made up of many different constituents, such as, you know, exchanges, wallets, uh, you know, users, uh, businesses, uh, developers, miners. These are all of these, uh, these, these different actors in the space play a specific part. And if and uh, what happens is is that sometimes some of these parts tries to get taken over. But the beautiful thing is is that again because of this adversarial thinking that we're talking about here, everybody is always making sure that everybody else is 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 playing by the rules. And if they're not, then you know the they are incentivized. The network is incentivized to kick them off. Uh, the actual game theory is such that it incentivizes 
good action. It incentivizes people to be good actors on the network. And so what we've seen is uh, various uh, take, takeover attempts. You know, the, the biggest one was last year uh, in 2017 with the user activated software. And for, if your listeners don't know, you know, a lot of people don't know about this story because they just came in late last year. And I'm finding a lot of people still are, are unfamiliar with this. But essentially, you know, there was a group of uh, companies and miners and exchanges that came together that wanted to change Bitcoin to the sense they actually literally wanted to change the repo. So as I mentioned to your listeners, to your listeners earlier, it was a big, get the location of the, the current location of the main implementation of Bitcoin is at github.com slash Bitcoin slash Bitcoin. And they, of course, wanted to change that to their own repo uh, led by a developer named Jeff Garzak. And they got together and they literally signaled 90% of the hash power of the entire network to change. That's what they were signaling. They were saying, hey guys, we're going to switch over to this new network change on this specific date in November. And what happened was, is that um, a lot of the network didn't agree with that. We, you know, the, the, a lot of the hard work of the developers, the open source developers, the, the contributions of these developers over years and years, you know, was would be simply just, oh, no, we're just going to copy that, paste that to a new location paste that code over to a new repo and so that didn't sit well yeah. with a lot of the you know, that didn't sit that didn't sit well with a lot of the network and so what happened was is we saw something somebody named by the name of Schellenfroy created something called the user activated software where it literally actually created some software that um, uh, would would actually split the chain to upgrade to SegWit. And if you did not upgrade to SegWit, then you would be kicked off the, the chain. And of course, to, you know, this this was a pretty much a um, uh, uh, a head-to-head -head collision between the community and these these companies. And so what we saw was is that the network actually chose to instead of split the chain, they chose to activate SegWit. So what happened was is that the the users ran this software, the user activated software, and it forced all of these companies Despite all of their money and all of their hash power and all of their advertising and all of their marketing, they still chose instead to activate SegWit and they called off their 2X, SegWit 2X uh, from Jeff Garzek that would have changed the repo. They called that off, canceled that, and now we have SegWit. And everybody uh, understands a little bit more that, that these running these full nodes, making sure that these rules are enforced. No matter who you are, you know that's what's important. And like I try to tell people in many different talks, I try to say that, look, who, who controls Bitcoin? Who is in control of Bitcoin? It's you. It's you, the user. You are in control of Bitcoin by declaring your sovereignty, by running a full node, by running the software that says you think that this version of Bitcoin is Bitcoin and nobody else can change that. And that is what's, that's what yeah. makes Bitcoin important. Yeah, fantastic. Fantastic comments. Uh, let's now outline a little bit, just for people who are a bit newer, what... Who are the key players or who are the key components or what are the key components of the Bitcoin ecosystem? So as an example, there's exchanges, there's wallets, you know, and so on and so forth. Um, let's start with uh, just the exchanges. What role do they play? Yeah, so the, it's interesting because uh, the exchanges, they're, they're really where most of the action sort of happens right now in these early days of Bitcoin. A lot of the transaction, a lot of the activity on the network is actually transactions, you know, going in and out of exchanges and activity on exchanges. And so uh, what we've seen is that um, they kind of play the the most, the biggest role of activity on the network. And so last year, as, as I've mentioned with the user activated software there, the exchanges were sort of getting pretty upset that uh, the fees were getting so high, but they didn't understand that they could do various techniques such as batching their transactions to save on fees. And so now what we've seen is that all these exchanges out there are now batching their transactions, and this is saving the network enormous amounts of money on fees. Uh, this is allowing for enormous more amounts of block space. And so this is really, really important. It allows the, the network to continue uh, uh, really, really, uh, you know, allows it to continue smoothly and uh, with, with low fees. And so uh, the exchanges really at this point, um, they kind of are the portal into uh, th this new world. They really are, uh, you know, as you know, Coinbase is arguably a, more of a wallet than an exchange, but at the same time, they, they they create that same function where they really are the window from the bridge from the old world into the new. This is how you get your cryptocurrencies is with these exchanges. And so, uh, th you know, they play a pretty big role, but again, you know, we, we've seen that, that eventually even they uh, have to learn and understand and um, adhere to the rules that the full nodes uh, say is Bitcoin. Right. Yep. Yep. And so the exchanges, as they exist today, they, like you say, they are, in a sense, they are an on-ramp into Bitcoin from the fiat world. How about 
wallets. And I understand, obviously, there's some relation there. But could you just outline what are some of the different possible wallets in the Bitcoin space? Yeah, and wallets is really important because they, they really provide the user interface. I mean, exchanges, sure, that's how you get, you know, your first Bitcoin maybe or your first cryptocurrencies. But wallets, you know, that's that's how you're going to work with cryptocurrency in the long term. That's how the end user, really mostly the end user is going to in the future use uh, these Bitcoins and cryptocurrencies. They're not going to really worry too much about exchanges. They're going to uh, have all of their cryptocurrencies all set in their wallets. And really, uh, a lot of wallets are going to do a lot of the functions that exchanges do today in the future. So they, if you need to, for example, within your wallet, uh, change some Bitcoin out for Litecoin, you'll be able to do that uh, within your wallet itself. So they're going to play a little bit, you know, there's a little bit of crossover over there. But really wallets, is, is, this is where all of your cryptocurrencies are going to be held. There's there's several wallets out there that focus on just Bitcoin. Then there's wallets that have all of these multi-currencies that you can hold many, many different coins in. And, uh, you know, there's wallets now uh, for the Lightning Network, which is the layer two uh, scaling solution for Bitcoin. And uh, some of these wallets, these interfaces, uh, such, as, such as the one called uh, Zap wallet made by somebody named Jack Mallers, uh, that wallet interface is just beautiful and gorgeous. And it's coming out for the for the iOS. And it really does look like an iOS wallet, like it belongs on iOS. The, the user interface is really slick. And uh, and so, you know, we're seeing that right now, most of the wallets, they, um, they're they getting better, right? They're, because this is what's really important is to, to onboard their mainstream is to get a nice user experience, a nice, pretty user experience with pretty user graphics. And we're getting there now. Uh, we're seeing a lot of the wallets in the space sort of upgrade now to these, you know, to, to really to meet the requirements uh, to sort of match and to compete directly with uh, things like PayPal and Venmo. We're basically there, you know, but with Coinbase and uh, and some of these other wallets out there, uh, th they really ha are getting there now. And so I think they they play an important role for the user experience, especially in the future as more and more people learn to use these new technologies. Yep, yep. And these are different ways of thinking. They're not, uh, they're not, kind of uh, familiar to the average person. So could you maybe outline the difference and the distinctions between say the hosted wallets, you know, what is a hosted wallet and what is more like an end user software wallet? Sure. So, I mean, there are, <clears throat> excuse me, there are wallets uh, on, on these exchanges, you know, cause every, um, <clears throat> Exchange has to still hold your cryptocurrencies, right? So there has to be a wallet then uh, there as well. So, you know, there's, uh, there's these hosted wallets that, for example, you can use these browser-based wallets. There's these wallet services that allows you to create them within your browser. Uh, but those, you know, they really aren't quite as secure as something like a hardware wallet. And so uh, what we recommend, I think you've recommended to your audience as well, Stefan, is mm. that, you know, if you're going to hold your, your cryptocurrency long term, if you're going to hold large amounts of cryptocurrency, we recommend that you use something called a hardware wallet. And there's a big difference between, for example, you know, wallets uh, on, on your desktop or wallets on your mobile phone, as we mentioned, like with the Zap wallet or a, a hardware wallet. And so this hardware wallet is something that is is designed and made specifically for holding large amounts of cryptocurrencies for large amounts of time. And so if something like a Trezor or something like a Ledger, uh, these two are the main sort of, you know, Coca-Cola and Pepsi competitors in the hardware wallet space, but there's a bunch more that are coming in, and this is going to be a huge, huge, huge market. So, uh, you know, in the future, as more and more people come into the cryptocurrency space, we're just a small sort of... Uh, pool right now, but eventually we will become this ocean of liquidity and, and demand uh, as, as the more and more of the world switches over to cryptocurrencies. Yeah, a great point around the different types of wallets there, Jeffrey. And I think it's, in, it's also a good thing to just outline the different, let's say the spectrum. So of control of the wallet versus convenience uh, versus best, better security and privacy. So on one end, um, you can think of it like the, you know, if you just leave your coins on an exchange, that might be really convenient, but it's very poor from a security and a privacy point of view. But then you, you've got the other end of the spectrum where if you are keeping things in what we've called a hardware wallet, and you might, you know, maybe if you've got a serious amount of coin, you might keep that in a vault and you might start looking at multi-signature kind of more advanced technology around that. And then there are also solutions that are coming that are now somewhere in between, such as the CASA wallet, which is a multi-signature style solution. So Jeffrey, if you could just outline a little bit on the different, um, how can I say it? the different possible ways that, you know, you don't have to choose one way, you can choose the way that works best for you. Yeah, and it's that's a great point, uh, Stefan. There's really all of these different layers and these levels of security, uh, depending on how much coin you have right so like i try to tell uh, new people uh, that are that are coming into the space to say look it, 
if you only are going to buy a hundred dollars amount of you know bitcoin only do a hundred dollars amount of research right because that's going to incentivize you to continue to learn more and more and as you put more and more in you're going to understand and find out that there are these these different levels of, of security and so uh like as you said uh, Stefan, there's these different um convenience right versus security type of layers because a lot of people just want to maybe use a bank and just kind of be like a bank this is uh, uh what the bit what services like coinbase can provide they really can provide that tr that hand holding traditional solution of just holding your coin for you because it's very 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 convenient you know they're federally insured they're pretty much a bank at this point they have all the regulations you know that's what coinbase is really really good at is is, is regulation that's what they really got down they're more of a regulation company almost than uh, than a software company more of a bank than a software company these days and so you, you can find convenience there in these types of wallets and solutions that will hold your hand but uh see that that sort of goes against the ethos of what bitcoin provides because the big thing that uh bitcoin provides is this is the first asset in the history of mankind that is unconfiscatable this is the first unconfiscatable asset in the history of mankind this this cannot be controlled censored it's frozen by anybody if you hold your own keys if you hold the bitcoin yourself and so that's a big promise of bitcoin you know because a lot of people get burned have been burned by banks and you know all over the world and so this is what you know bitcoin is, is here to help with and really uh provide that store of value and so in order to really execute on that store of value you have to hold the keys because hey uh, as andreas antonopoulos likes to say if it's not your keys it's not your bitcoin and so people make these trade-offs they try to go a little bit more convenient with with Coinbase, but unfortunately, then they sort of lose their sovereignty. They're no longer really even holding Bitcoin. They're just it's just numbers in a database at that point, and that's just like the traditional fiat system. So uh, we recommend that you hold uh, that you take a little bit more responsibility and hold your coins in, in you know more of a difficult solution called a hardware wallet. And it's really not that much more difficult, right? We're just talking. All the interfaces look the same. You just have to uh, do a little bit more research into these other types of solutions, and then. Then in addition to that, like you say, uh, we have these multi-sig uh, solutions now like Casa Wallet, which is pretty cool. This is from Jameson Lop. He used to work at Bitco, uh, which is one of the largest companies in Bitcoin, the Bitcoin and cryptocurrency space. They secure large amounts of funds. They are this uh, custodial solution for a lot of the big companies in the space like exchanges and things like that. And so uh, they, uh, Jameson Lop, needless to say, is a pretty good expert about managing your your keys, managing your coin uh, to make sure that it is uh, most secure. And so what they do is they allow you uh, for a fee to be able to hold one of your keys for you. So that if you're, you know, to make sure that you, uh, if you lose your keys over on this end, you know, that you're, that you're still be okay to make sure that requires one more person in order to take out all of the funds, you know, to make sure that, for example, if somebody comes to your home and tries to rob you or something like that, right, they can't, you can't, they can't get your keys. There is a, there is somebody else holding that key. And so um, there's, there's solutions like that. But of course, those are for the uh, more recommended uh you know, for the for the larger stashes, I believe they charge like ten thousand dollars a year or something, something close to that nature. Yeah. And so, yeah, that's a little bit on the extension. But you, as you mentioned, there is this spectrum of all of these different uh, ways of holding your cryptocurrencies, and it's just going to take a generational change, really, to sort of understand this. It's like going from standard email to email. We're we're going from you know uh, just a couple of just just one currency in the first world, you know, usually to to many tens of currencies and sometimes hundreds of currencies. And so, uh, for a lot of the world, it's not a huge change, but uh, you know, especially for some some people in like China and South Korea, they're a lot more digital than we are over here in the United States. But uh, this is the future. This is what's coming, and it's really, really going to be important to understand these things. and And I hope that your audience, you know, goes and explores uh, some of these different solutions. Yeah, great comments. Okay, let's now talk a little bit about merchants and payment processing using Bitcoin. So can you outline who are the key players there, whether they are one centralized company or whether they're an open source alternative, let's say? So it's, yeah, there's there's a couple of big ones. Like always, you always have your, you know, Pepsi and, and Cola. They got, we got the big ones, right? The, the Coke versus Pepsi. So you have like Coinbase and BitPay. These are some of the big... Uh, payment processors out there, but there really is a lot of little ones. You know, uh, the, if you if you Google, you can find there's there's really a lot of little ones out there, and it's it's a competitive space. You don't have to, um, you know, ha have a million dollars of investment to create one of these things, really, because the software is all open. Uh, all you know, there, there's a whole community, host of community to help you there, and so um, there there's a whole. Um, open source community that is actually building payment processors as well you know so if you actually you know need help even starting a payment processor company you know so there is open source uh, solutions white label solutions something called uh btc pay server 
where you can actually go and create your own merchant company if if you'd like to. If that's something that you'd want to do, you can you can just uh, create your own merchant company, or you can just use it uh, for your own company to be able to. Uh, receive crypto and accept crypto that way but yeah the uh, the space is sort of wide open right now it really is the wild west it's early days there will be uh more pay more merchant processors coming uh pretty soon but coinbase and bitpay are really the big ones right now yeah yeah fair points okay how about other online bitcoin services that exist so uh, an example might be a blockchain explorer uh, or maybe Bitcoin statistics. Do you want to comment a little bit on some of the key players in that area? So, you know, there, there's a couple of different sites that we like to go to, to, to find things about the network, because remember everything about Bitcoin pretty much is open. So you can find statistics about the mempool. You can find statistics about the blocks, uh, when they get created, how, all the transactions in the blocks. And so, you know, blockchain.com uh, has a lot of these statistics that you can go to. They have a lot of charts and information where you can find out all about, uh, you know, the growth of the network and, and, and how healthy it is. And, uh, you know, uh, needless to say, right now it's very healthy. It's uh, the fees are low, the transactions are up, the wallets are up. So it's it's a very a uh, very healthy network right now. And um, uh, again, all this information is open. So that that's one of the big sites there is blockchain.com to be able to find that. And then you know there's lots of different uh, sites out there to view different prices of currencies. There's um, there's really a whole bunch of them out there. And um, I, I hope that. Uh, you know, this continues, this, this, as you say, this grassroots community continues to build all of these open source sites because there's there's just so many of them at this point. Uh, but those are the big ones. Uh, Blockchain.com is where you find all of the great charts uh, that, that, a lot, that, that you might have seen <laughs> come across your Twitter sphere. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. Let's now talk about the development teams in Bitcoin. So there's, you know, there's Bitcoin Core, but there are different implementations of Bitcoin. So could you just outline a little bit on that? Yeah, that's a really, really important point for your listeners that, that I hope we can really drill here, drill down into, because this is an important thing to understand. Again, you know, Bitcoin truly is decentralized. And so it even is decentralized down to the implementation. So what that means is that there are different actual versions of Bitcoin uh, that people can run. So there are different software implementations. What happens is, is these different implementations run on different languages and run on different operating systems and run on different types of computers. And so, but they all adhere to still the same rule sets, right? The same rule sets uh, that are enforced by the full nodes. So the main Bitcoin implementation is called Bitcoin Core. That's, that's the default implementation that that's, was actually started by uh, Satoshi herself, right? So that is um, the, what, what, what actually is still backwards compatible, going all the way back to the very first version. And backwards compatibility is something that's really, really, really important to, to Bitcoin Core. This is why it takes so long to get changes implemented into it. And so what happens is that sometimes people, you know, maybe not don't, maybe don't want to wait that long. They want to have their own implementation, right? And do their own experiments. And this is great uh, so, because Bitcoin is open source. You can just fork it anytime. And so, for example, Blockstream, they have their own implementation of Bitcoin called Elements, right? That's what's really cool. They, they do all sorts of uh, different um, uh, experimentations on that with their liquid sidechain, uh, you know, with confidential transactions and confidential assets, all sorts of cool stuff uh, with that. So that's a different implementation there. Uh, but, um, you know, and then there's different languages because, you know, Bitcoin Core is in C++, uh, C++ right? So there's, there's implementations of Bitcoin for Java. There's implementations for Bitcoin for C Sharp, for example, uh, Nicola Doye, who uh, I mentioned earlier, uh, BTC Pay Server, he created that as well. But uh, BTC Pay Server actually lives on top of one of these implementations called uh, N Bitcoin. And so, you know, they, they, they it's a, well, that's more of a library on top of, of, of the Bitcoin implementation, but there's libraries as well on top of these implementations. There's different um, uh, libraries that you can choose from. So it, it really gets really vast and, and uh, really spread out of all these different types of people that are. Um, running their different versions of Bitcoin or running uh, different um, new features on Bitcoin. But again, the important thing to remember across all these implementations, there's there's dozens of them now at this point, across all these implementations, they are still all adhering to uh, the rules that are enforced by the full nodes that, that, and again, anybody can run and download to make sure that they're running their version of Bitcoin. So it's really cool to see this, these, this, this really decentralized approach to 
protocol development, everybody's got their own opinions and their own ideas and their own languages, and they can all uh, work together continuously. Uh, we, we see the harmony, uh, the harmony in all of these different implementations, because sometimes uh, something, somebody has an idea on one and they're like, oh man, that is really great. That is a better optimization than what we're doing. Uh, we're going to do it that way. And so they can make an upgrade to their own implementation. And in that way, you know, we're all sort of working on Bitcoin together uh, in our own way. And that's what's really uh, one of the really cool things about these, this open source, free open source development on this decentralized protocol. Excellent. Yeah, I like that explanation. It's a really nice way to outline that there are different implementations, but we are they're sort of interoperable and they kind of work together in that way to help, you know, build on top of Bitcoin. Now, one other area I thought would be great to get you to comment on, Jeffrey, is fintech versus fin UI. Can you outline a little bit about what you mean when you say that? Yeah, so you know, I've tweeted this out uh, uh, probably a couple times, you know, at this point. But to me, really, at this point, uh, fintech, you know, uh, this is there's sort of a whole industry in Silicon Valley about this, you know, called this quote unquote fintech. Uh, really, it's it, like, for example, like PayPal and Venmo and things like that. They're calling this thing fintech. But to me, what I like to call this is it's just fin UI. All it is is a uh, new user interfaces, new coats of paint over the same old car, the same old engine that's been running since the 70s. This is what all the traditional infrastructure is built upon, literally mainframe 70s software, all, all the stuff on Wall Street, a lot of the banks mainframes, uh, a lot of this technology uh, that, that you know we, we put fresh user interface, fresh uh, user interfaces over like Wells Fargo.com, right? These these interfaces, these apps, we're like, oh, this is fintech, this is this is new technology. And it's not, it's just user interfaces, new user interfaces over old, traditional, you know, centralized technology that really hasn't evolved since the 70s. The last, the last new actual, quote unquote, fintech innovation probably was credit cards, right? That uh, Before that, that's maybe checks. That, that's really about it. There's only been a couple of these, quote unquote, fintech innovations. The rest of it really at this point is just user interfaces, you know, people creating apps over the top of them, uh, people maybe creating games. Uh, it, it's just uh, really a fresh coat of paint over the same same old car. And I think that's what's really an important point to make for people so they can really uh, get grounded and understand what, what what's happening here in the marketplace. We really are having this new, what I like to call, this global financial renaissance, this new way that humanity is thinking about money. It's important to separate that, right? This new understanding of money with, this, this, with, with something like Bitcoin and blockchain uh, from this uh, PayPal, Venmo, you know, old school, uh, what they call fintech way of thinking, where again, they're just slapping new coats of paint over the same old car. This is about building a new car. This is about building a new infrastructure, uh, something that we can, um, something that's more fair, something that's more open, something that we can really build an entirely new, you know, economy of scale over the top of, because this, as Andreas likes to say, you know, Bitcoin blockchain really is the third wave of the internet. This is the fifth layer of abstraction of money, the most abstracted layer that we've ever had, the most sound money we've ever had. So it's important to differentiate that from, uh, you know, from the traditional stuff that, that's quote unquote fintech. Mm, yeah. I th yeah. I like the point you're making around really dis distinguishing Bitcoin as a true innovation versus some of the other, you know, quote unquote innovation that's really more just surface layer. Um, okay. So let's now Shill, your programming with Bitcoin course. So, Jeffrey, tell us tell us about the course uh, and what can we learn. Yes, we love we love to shill. <laughs> no, uh, it's uh, this <laughs> this course is uh, no. This is a really uh, uh, I think a really important course uh, for the community itself because you know I, I really was inspired by by Jimmy's course. Jimmy Song out there is creating the uh, of course the programmingblockchain.com course, and he's just churning out developer after developer, you know, into the ecosystem. And I just think that that's amazing. And you know, as Elizabeth Stark likes to say, we we need to scale Jimmy Song. Like I, I, we need to scale him, but we can't because he's a human. And so, <laughs> what you know, what, I just thought that there might, might be some opportunity there to get some more uh, developers working with Bitcoin. But the problem is, that for me, is that I'm just a web developer. Like I'm just an application developer. You know, I make forms on websites and you know put data in a database from a form. Like really basic, you know, stuff. Right? Compared to this this crazy protocol development, you know, that, that Jimmy is teaching people. Literally, the mathematics behind some of this cryptography, elliptic curve cryptography, kind of crazy, crazy stuff. And I just think that. 
that that's great, but that's such a specialized and niche field that there's it leaves a lot of people like myself and maybe other C sharp developers out there um, sort of um, you know wandering because we we want to we want to work with Bitcoin. There's a lot of people out there I think that want to work with Bitcoin. A lot of developers that really want to work with Bitcoin, but get intimidated by some of this protocol level stuff. And I think uh, with with uh, libraries like uh, and Bitcoin, as I mentioned earlier from uh, Nick, Nicola Doye, uh, C, uh, specifically for C sharp developers, we can start uh, learning how to integrate Bitcoin into our applications without actually working on Bitcoin. And so that's a really big uh, differentiation there between uh, Jimmy's course and mine is that Jimmy's is for uh, teaching protocol developers how to work on Bitcoin. And my course is for teaching application developers how to work with Bitcoin, uh, specifically the end Bitcoin library. And so I think that um, this is important to get more and more developers working with Bitcoin. We need to get not just protocol developers, but you know, even Elizabeth herself said, and Matt Corello and other developers have said, look, uh, there has to be an order of magnitude more application developers out there than protocol developers because we need people building stuff on bitcoin we need people building on bitcoin that's what's really important and so i think that that's something that uh the community needs the ecosystem needs is more developers and that's what we're trying to do uh me and nicola who is the uh, who is teaching the course uh again we're teaching how to uh, application developers how to use c sharp to work with this N Bitcoin library to be able to begin uh, integrating Bitcoin into their applications, and it's a it's a two day course. You know, it's just like Jimmy's where we, we kind of throw a lot at you. It's in two days. It's kind of like a full uh, blown college course in two days. So you learn you learn a lot, but we we make sure to get, that you have notes. We make sure to give you you know all the slides and and all the source code and good things like that. So uh, but yeah, we, we we we're really thrilled. We just had our first workshop actually in Las Vegas, Nevada. We just recently closed that up, and that was a great time. Uh, everybody seemed to be pretty happy and uh, we were all pretty impressed with with the knowledge that Nick has uh, in the space because he, he does so much work in the space and continues to to do a lot of open source work and so we really thank Nick for that and uh, yeah we really hope to get more people working with Bitcoin right yeah that's great and so who should apply how much experience should someone have before they apply for the course Sure. And so maybe I should also maybe mention the name of the course. <laughs> so uh, the name of the course is uh, programmingwithbitcoin.com. And uh, it's, it's, it really is, uh, you know, uh, a passion project of, of mine and Nick's to be able to get more developers in here. And we really don't um, require you to have too much knowledge. Uh, we actually uh, maybe only require to have six months to a year, maybe a, a year and a half tops of C-sharp. So just basic C-sharp knowledge. And of course, you can find plenty of, of, of websites, course, courses, uh, tutorials, videos on the internet. You know, uh, my favorite site is uh, learncs.org, learncs.org. That's a free site where you can go and learn uh, C Sharp right in the web browser. You don't even have to, you know, download anything, read a book, nothing. You just <laughs> follow the tutorial. So uh, you don't require a whole lot of knowledge there. But uh, we, uh, and in fact, we don't actually even require a whole lot of Bitcoin knowledge because we want to make sure that we teach you the fundamentals of Bitcoin and blockchain as well so that you're prepared. So we teach you the fundamentals for about proof of work, about running a full node, all that good stuff so that you are fully prepared to, to receive the information in this course. And so that we can just onboard more and more developers to make it that much easier to onboard more people. So we don't require much from you, just a little bit of C-sharp experience and uh, we can take it from there. Excellent. Yeah, I think this is a really exciting space to be in because this is the future of money. So it's now a great time to go and learn more and be able to build products and software within that space. So that's why I think it's a great idea uh, for any of the listeners who are interested, go and um, look this up. So what's the, I think the website is programmingwithbitcoin.com, right? That's correct. Yes. That's the one. Okay, excellent. Uh, did you have any other comments on uh, programming with Bitcoin or um, I, let's now actually uh, talk about you know, where do you, what's the outlook for, you know, the Bitcoin ecosystem over the next year or two, let's say? Sure. So, um, you know, it's really looking, the, the fundamentals of Bitcoin are just really looking great. There's just, there's more papers about Bitcoin than ever. There's more podcasts about Bitcoin. There's more activity. There's more liquidity. There's more uh, transactions. There's more wallets. There's more tension. Wall Street uh, is putting out, you know, options and futures and there's talk of ETFs. So the fundamentals of Bitcoin really have never been better. Uh, but specifically, like, what everybody's sort of focused on within the Bitcoin ecosystem right now is the Lightning Network. Uh, the Lightning Network really is this order of magnitude scaling solution that Bitcoin needs in order to onboard the rest of the world eventually. So 
it's it's really early days right now, but you know the Lightning Network was launched earlier this year, and it continues to just grow by orders of magnitude. It continues to grow exponentially uh, in the amount of channels and, and liquidity that's that's within the Lightning Network. And so I think that, uh, in my opinion, uh, by the end of next year, I think the entire ecosystem at, at that point will have integrated Lightning into their into their actual application stack. So that means all the wallets, all the exchanges, they'll all be you know running over the top of the Lightning Network because it is faster, better, and cheaper, and that's what's really important. You know, it's economically it makes economic sense, and it's good for the network, and uh, it's it's really really great. So I think that that is going to be. Um, the next the next big step for uh, for the ecosystem is for that to be integrated because then after that uh, going into 2020 2021 we can really start onboarding merchants and all the the, the regular retail investors and and retail uh, uh, the companies and, and applications and we can start building this this whole new application layer on top of Bitcoin you know within this lightning ecosystem and see all sorts of apps uh, applications that we can't even really imagine right now. <laughs> it's like almost trying to imagine, you know, uh, Facebook and, uh, you know, uh, and YouTube in 1994. Like some people did, right? So there was a couple of visionaries, uh, but most of us were like, wow, just completely baffled. And so this is the kind of stuff that we're going to make possible, just just things that, that aren't possible now. And so uh, that is what's going to really, really, really be big. And of course, by 2024, at that point, you know, governments are holding Bitcoin. Uh, it's uh, almost everything is, is will have we'll flipped over the, to the Bitcoin infrastructure at that point. And by 2028, right, it's all over. It'll be like talking like the dollar, It'll be like talking yeah. about the dollar. And so, yeah, it's it's just a whole lot of, you know, it's really early days right now. I try to tell everybody, and I'll definitely tell your listeners as well, that it is still really early days, you know, in in, in, in the Bitcoin ecosystem. Things move fast, right? This is, this is moving faster than the internet did. This is moving faster than anything else does. Uh, really, I like to tell people that like every couple of months is about a year, you know, in, in the outside world. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it really is. Bitcoin is just it moves so fast. And so uh, I, I just try to tell people that it moves fast. But hey, it's very, very early still. And there's plenty of we need a plenty of people. I mean, I hope your listeners know, Stefan, that we need developers, we need designers, we need business people, we need it all, you know, Bitcoin needs it all. And I try to tell people, you know, to do what you love, but do it with Bitcoin, because uh, this is something that, again, as you say, can change the world. This is some real world changing technology. This is some real stuff that can actually make a difference. This is not like Hope Coin or or some of the other blockchain projects that are out there. This is not you know VR. This is actual stuff for people to uh, you know that saves lives that let, that is able to save the uh, your your value actually store your value for your children for your children's children uh, to have an unconfiscatable asset that nobody can freeze that you can actually save your wealth in uh, that can't be printed away. And so this is uh you know this is this is where you want to be if you want to be in the latest and the greatest stuff. This space is great to be. This is a really hot hot space there there's a lot of room uh for for people to come in right now they're paying pretty good salaries and you know i just hope that uh, we can continue to build this really this global financial renaissance together excellent stuff yeah i like that um, vortex or jeffrey uh they, that, that's a great way to finish up so i think what we'll do now is just link back to all of your channels and your links so guys if you want to find vortex look him up on twitter his handle is at the one vortex all spelt out in you know words uh look up the cryptocast network on youtube and also the website for that is cryptocast.network and lastly look up jeffrey's programming with bitcoin course and so the website for that is programming with bitcoin.com uh, is there anything else that you'd like to point out or any final comments jeffrey no i think that's it i had a great time steph and i hope we can do this again i hope maybe we can uh, do some more stuff on my network as well uh with you in the future steph and i'd love to you know have you on a couple of my shows and i uh, just can't thank you enough for the content that you that you put out i've listened to almost almost everything you you, you continue to interview uh, people that are important to me in the space and so i just uh you know definitely thank you thank you so much <laughs> all right well thanks very much excellent uh, it's been a pleasure to have you on the show today jeffrey thank you Thank you so much, man. Have a good day. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Vortex. We tried to target it a little bit more towards Bitcoin newbies. As always, you can find my show notes on the website stefanlevera.com. Just go on the website and search SLP19 on the site. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast. It's a great way for you to learn and to keep yourself updated on what's happening in Bitcoin. Also, I appreciate if you can share the podcast with your friends. And lastly, you can come and find me on Twitter. My handle is at Stefan Levera. Thanks, guys. That's it from me, and I'll speak to you next time. Thanks for listening. You can find the show notes on stefanlevera.com. And please share the podcast on social media.